from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 51, recorded on December 14th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome. I'm Good to see you. proud to say I'm boosted. So hopefully, hopefully everybody else is getting their boosters. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Great to see everyone. Glad to be back and looking forward to this episode. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. I'm um, excited to talk about this paper. I just uh, recorded um, Quiv with Brianne, so. Yes, so, you guys are busy. You, so are you, yeah. not, not too long are you ago. Si- are you sick of each other yet or you're okay Yeah, I'm this? totally, totally sick of each other. I managed at one point in the Twiv episode, I actually had a comment about what it made me think about something in this paper, but I decided to hold oh. back. <laughs> so much to talk about today. I know, I know. Um, but before we talk about that paper, I wanted to quickly mention that ASV is um, doing some vaccine education town halls where there are a number of different experts who are answering questions about um the COVID-19 vaccine to anyone who would like to attend over Zoom. There's one coming up on December 20th. And if anyone is interested, they can go to asv.org slash education. All right. We have a guest today who I think is in New Haven. He's got a big Y on his, yeah. uh, on his sweatshirt there. Um, uh, Nikki Joshi, welcome to Immune. Thank you. Thank you for having me. New Haven, Connecticut, yeah. <laughs> right on the, can you see the water from your window there? Not at this side. They give the, the PIs don't get the nice <laughs> view. The nice view is actually on the lab side. So. Very nice. Well, that's good. They, they probably, there's probably more people on the lab side for longer periods of time, right? So yeah. give them the good side. Well, what's funny is I started out over there. This was my, I was in my, this is my lab, but I was in for graduate school. And then oh I my took gosh. it up years later. So. Oh, that's kind of cool. I have a nice view. Now I have the. Not as nice. Wow. Well, I have no view. Now, so, so Cindy, tell us about how this uh, episode came about and how Nick is joining us. And then I think Vincent will walk us through Nick's background and story. Yeah. So uh, Nick came and gave a talk here at Cornell. Was that not even that long ago, like two weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, I, I was just sitting in the audience going, oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. Because I read, you know, read the paper and, you know, it just, Incredible! You're going to hear about this incredibly creative ways to do this. And I, once I heard you talk, I was like, mm, "There's going to be a lot of really cool immunology that comes out of using this system over I, your career." I guess <laughs> you'll probably make new, new things, but certainly uh, these mice that you've created open up a lot of doors to ask some fundamental immunology questions that we have really not been able to do in a rigorous way. And I think now we can do that. And so I just thought, what what better person to have on to talk about this really cool paper? Because I, you, you'll notice a, a theme in the ones that I pick are kind of like these like techie, weird, cool, new things that come <laughs> along. And so this was a very techie, weird, new, cool thing. And so that's, that's why I thought it'd be great to have you come on. And on short notice, you were able to say, hey, yeah, I'd love to. So I was like, we should do this paper. And Steph said, we should invite him on. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I invited you and we're like, oh, I didn't hear back. We didn't hear back. And then you, you said yes. And I'm like, yay. It's great. better. It's better that this paper has its uh, uh, the author yeah, to talk sure. us through it. Yeah, because I don't want to screw up the, the <laughs> mice going on. and everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I may have mispronounced your name at the top. So you, people call you Nick, but what is the pronunciation of your full name? Oh, Nikhil. Nikhil. Uh, okay. But- I, I Only call, my mom calls me Nikhil. So. Okay, I won't call you that, but I did. I called you Nikki, but I'm, I apologize. Nikhil is the right way, but we'll call you Nick. Okay. I, I went by Nikki for many years. Oh yeah. As a child, oh. so I, I, you know, it's fine. Okay, thanks. So tell us a little of your history, uh, where, where you're from, and trained, and so forth. Yeah, so uh, I started uh, as an undergrad many years ago at, at University of Michigan, which is hmm. only relevant 
because we're now winning at football again. Oh, listen, <laughs> I went to Ohio State for both my undergrad and my PhD, and I'm dying with the Michigan people in my life right now. So we got to keep that to a minimum. <laughs> it's been a rough couple of years, right? Yeah, uh, right. you deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that when I was an undergrad there, you know, I got really interested in immunology. Uh, eventually found my way uh, through a few different places uh, in doing a master's in public health at uh, Johns Hopkins. And then I worked uh, with Pat Gerhardt looking at mechanisms of somatic hypermutation, uh, which was a long time ago. It was right around the time that AID was discovered. Uh, and then I then I went and did my PhD work at Yale with uh, Sue Keck, working on memories of mem- uh, development of memory T cells and uh, how T cells uh, differentiate into short lived effector cells. Uh, and then I went and did a, after that, very interested in cancer. Uh, so I went and worked with Tyler Jacks on development of animal models of, of cancer and then tried trying to use those uh, to study uh, cancer immunology. And so I've I been. Guess at, Sue, Sue left so you could take the lab back. That's right, actually. <laughs> So I was a, when I was a postdoc at MIT, uh, Tyler was a, was a PhD student. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time. He's, he's, he's been, he's been uh, there for a while now. So. Yeah. Well, he left and came back, but he was uh, clearly a star, uh, even yeah. as a student. Good stuff. In fact, the work you're going to talk about reminds me, uh, when I was there, there were a lot of very creative people, uh, in particular, uh, Richard Mulligan used to design all kinds of crazy vectors and this and that, which is you've amplified now many times beyond that. But uh, I'm, I'm used to this sort of thing happening. It's really interesting. Solving problems. Yeah, it, it actually, uh, you know, I, the reason I ended up in Tyler's lab is uh, when I was a, I, in between undergrad and, and um, going to Hopkins, I'd spent a year at the NIH. Uh, and we had one of those, you know, they would have those director's lectures and mm-hmm. Tyler came and gave this talk. This is like 2000 ish. Uh, he gave this talk on this mouse that they had made where you could give virus and you could turn on oncogenes. And I was just so fascinated by this idea. Uh, and now that's the, the KRAS mouse that we use. So I, I was really just sort of intrigued by this way of doing science. Uh, and that's what I ended up doing for my postdoc. So I, I was wrong. Tyler was a postdoc at MIT with Bob Weinberg. Um, right. He was a he was a grad student actually working on HIV yeah. uh, with uh, with um, uh, Harold Varmus, right? Harold Varmus. Yeah. You. His most cited paper ever is on HIV. Hmm. Good stuff. Most people don't know that. What was your pandemic experience as a new assistant professor? When did you start your lab? Was it pre-pandemic? I started in 2016. Oh, 16. Uh, okay, got it. And I was, you know, I, I feel like uh, a lot of people uh, had, you know, very, obviously everybody was impacted tremendously by the pandemic. Uh, we were extremely lucky uh, that a lot of the work that we were doing had kind of pro- progressed to the point where it was almost mature and didn't need too much more. But so many friends got stuck on the other side of that hump. Right. And so we, I, I think we were just very lucky in, in the timing of, uh, I mean, it's always unlucky, but it was very lucky for us, the timing. But I, I think this is such a, a careful issue for people these days. You know, I have friends That's who were awesome. just completely devastated because of oh, their, it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. And how it hit them. So. So before we transition, uh, you know, away from your background, I'm just, do you have any, you know, words of wisdom, nuggets of advice for, for, for somebody who's, you know, been there from the training years and you've gone through it and now you're in the, the, the dream job, the assistant professor job. So what, what, anything that you can instill? Yeah, I think that the biggest one is uh, to pick things that you're very passionate about. I think all, almost everybody on this podcast almost certainly is going to say that same thing. Uh, you know, you pick these things that you really care about, and you hope that other people care about them too. And uh, you know, you pour your your energy into that, and uh, hopefully that that leads you somewhere. And, that- and I should I should say, I mean your dream career. There are many dream careers. I don't want to say that academia, because listen, academia can be a hot mess. So, you know, uh, other people's (laughs) dream careers, maybe industry, maybe, you know, government, but anywho, your dream career. So that's, that's great to hear. Actually sort of, oh, sorry. 
sort of related on the uh, background front as well. Um, were you always interested in science or did you have some other dream career before that? <laughs> I, I started off, I wanted to be an architect uh, and I was really not very good at it. So I had to find something else. <laughs> but you're really designing biotechnology yeah. to- tools. You know, that's interesting that you were interested in architecture. Yeah, I love architecture. I think it's amazing. <laughs> I was not, it was not a good career for me. It's good to find that out early on, right? Yeah. All right, we have your paper here, uh, Nature Biotechnology, Inducible De Novo Expression of Neoantigens in Tumor Cells and Mice. So it's got great constructs, and I hope you, you tell us about them. But can, maybe you could start by uh, giving the, the backstory here, why, why this is a thing that you wanted to do. Yeah, so when I was a... Um Actually, when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, there was this uh, push, I think, from a lot of people to try and understand various different aspects of T-cell biology. Uh, specifically, there was a lot of interest in, in uh, the concept of peripheral tolerance. Uh, and there was this technical problem that most people knew about, which was uh, you wanted to be able to study how T-cells function in the, in the context of different tissues. But uh, there was always this leaky expression of antigen in the thymus with the experimental models. Uh, and that was a, it was something that I kind of knew as a, as a background. And when I went to Tyler's lab, uh, you know, we were talking a lot about the ways we were turning on antigens in our tumor models, which is kind of a similar problem. And the lab had, had ventured into making models where they turned on antigens using a lock stop locks element. Uh, so, you know, trying to shut off the antigen, I and mean, even that didn't work because of the leakiness. And so we were trying to think of new ways to solve this problem. Uh, and I actually, because I had been thinking about it before, I contacted a few people who I knew from elsewhere, Steve Jamison and others, uh, and they sort of gave me some advice on how it could be done. Uh, but the technical expertise were something that I just happened to be in the right spot to actually try and try and take on. Uh, so. Oh, go ahead, Fran. So there's one piece to this that I was thinking a lot about, um, and I kind of wanted to know your perspective on this issue. Um, so, you know, it, you're talking about making sure that you can look at the response to an antigen in a tissue without that antigen being in the thymus. Yep. And um, my first thought is, well, that's something that we see frequently in an infectious disease case. Yep. Um, but of course, you're doing this in a non-infectious context. So you sort of maybe don't have that inflammatory side. And so could you talk about how this is a different type of situation than the infectious disease situation? Yeah. And also yeah. just, just from the, for our audience, it might be helpful just to do a quick, what is central, what is peripheral tolerance? So when we talk about leakiness, what does that mean in this con- in these two concepts? Yeah, for sure. So um, the first one I'll do, which is the the central versus peripheral tolerance, which is maybe a little easier for me. Uh, And that is this idea that uh, when T cells are getting educated in the thymus, uh, they're going to see, in theory, all of the antigens that are present in the genome. Now, of course, it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, there, there, there are specialized cells in the thymus that are designed to present those antigens uh, to the, to the developing thymocytes. And then, uh, if those antigens are encountered, those T cells can get deleted or they can get uh, converted to Tregs uh, in some cases, uh, or the response can be altered. Uh, the, their development can be altered. So when they come out into the periphery now, uh, you know, when they are exposed to antigen, they should respond in a, in a naive way uh, because they shouldn't have seen it in thymus. That's, those are the antigens that we're interested in. So in the context of, say, a, an infection, of course, you have all of the, the, the signals that come along with infection, the, the TLR, ligands, the inflammation, uh, and that fundamentally changes the presentation of antigen. Uh, and so what we were interested in, to some extent, is, is what happens if you don't have all those things. Uh, that's, that's really more the situation where you expect to see peripheral tolerance. Uh, and we wanted to be able to dissociate that from what's going on in the central tolerance, where I think we have a much better idea of how things work. So to to put it in an even simpler way, you want to be able to have a mouse at any age and turn on an antigen that's foreign to the mouse and study what happens to to the T-cell response, right? Yes. 
And you'd like and, to be able to... And in the absence control. of infection, right? Right, so you can right. Do it in the absence of inflammation. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I should be careful because we're, we're not perfect. I mean, we've, we've knocked it down quite a bit. Uh, the things that we ultimately use to induce the the, the antigen are uh, doxycycline and tamoxifen. And some people would argue that there are some there is some inflammation associated with that. We even try, we try to make it as low immunogenous or low inflama- inflammation as possible by feeding the mouse doxycycline and tamoxifen. Uh, but still, I think there's, you know, not trying to say that, especially in the in the department that Janeway started, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> inflammation is not important for activating uh, the innate immune system. And when you talk about leakiness and in other models that have been developed before, there had always been at least some low level of expression of this antigen that makes its way to the thymus that then allows for central tolerance to kick in. And so then when you want to induce these T cells, they've already seen it. There's already a tolerance built in. And so your goal then is to induce a system with a lot of different regulatory elements that the mouse can express the antigen in vivo, and that's the first time it sees it. So t- you can you can study T cell reactions um, pr- in its prime their prime state, right? Uh, and and the idea is is you know we the the ninja model, which is what what we called it, uh, has this element in it where the antigen that the T cells will respond to is is you know, broken in half. The DNA for that is broken in half and inverted. Uh, so that you, when you turn it on, you actually flip that one part around, uh, and that creates the new antigen. Uh, and right. so therefore, uh, it, it can't be leaky before you actually want to turn it on. So, so let's break down. So what, what you're now describing is this ninja model and it, based on your paper, there's two different components that we can talk about. There, there's the neoantigen module, and then there's yeah. the regulatory element. So maybe walk us through first the neoantigen module, how you prove that in your different model systems, and then what does the regulatory elements do and what are these all these components that you added? Yeah, so um, the neoantigen module uh, is a, it's a piece of uh, DNA uh, that contain, that encodes uh, some immunogenic peptides. So they're the, uh, the, everyone's favorite antigens from LCMV. Uh, this GP33 is a peptide. Uh, that CD8 T cells recognize, and GP66 is a peptide that uh, CD4 T cells recognize. There's a little bit more to it than that, but those are the main elements. Uh, and then LCMV uh, is a virus that has been highly studied. There's a lot of tools. Yeah. Vincent, have you had any experience with this virus in your training years and your? No, I, you know, research? I'm not an immunologist, so I would never get near it. Right? You would never. Okay. <laughs> there are some some virologists who used to study it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, but uh, you know, I know Rafi Ahmed and and people like that did a little immunology, a little virology. But no, I'm just joking. Yeah, it's a it's a, a workhorse for uh, immunologists. It's a mouse virus, and uh, there are lots of reagents, uh, as you said. Right. Lymph lymphat. What is it? Lymphatic chorio. Lymphocytic. Lymphocytic chorio meningitis virus. Right. Yeah. Almost. And it's a blind. chronic infection, right? There's, it can be. It can. It can. It can depends. Be either, which makes it convenient. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been the, 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 the what's been so convenient about it is it's a nice system for studying acute and chronic infection. It was something that uh, I had studied as a graduate student in Sue's lab. We had done a lot of work with, with LCMV. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turns out um, when you're trying to make splice sites, which is what we was the first thing we needed to do, uh, the, the sequence that you are looking for is an, it's a K and an A. Uh, the, the amino acids K and A, and those are the first two amino acids of of the GP33 element. Mm. Um, and very so nice. that was very convenient. I actually first started trying to do it with OVA, but OVA does not have K and A. Mm. So then I had to choose LCM. And uh, other aspects of this that are really important is there, you mentioned a lot of immunologic tools that are available if you use this particular antigen, can you comment on some of them and what their, you know, importance is in, to be able to do your study? Yeah, so um, we have, uh, you know, very well characterized MHC class one and class two tetramers uh, that, that will recognize the cells that recognize the, the uh, antigens in, in Ninja. Uh, and then there's TCR transgenic mice uh, that have T cells that have TCRs on their surface that recognize both the CD4 and the CD8. 
those uh, many people will be familiar with P14 cells and then less familiar with Smarta, which is the CD4 version. Uh, Poor CD4 version. <laughs> would there be any? Wonder- yeah, it doesn't get as much love. <laughs> would yeah. there be any situation where you would use an, a neoantigen for which you had no reagents whatsoever or very few? Well, I mean, I think a lot of the tumor immunology field yeah. does that. Right? Yeah. And that's that's been, you know, a blessing and a curse, right? It's it's more physiologic. It's you know, if you're studying human anti-tumor responses in, in humans, you, you often don't know these things. Uh, but it it creates problems, you know. Uh, and so for the for the types of stuff where we, we normally are are looking, we want to study responses and in, in sort of a a characteristic fashion over time. Uh, and so it helps to be able to study the same T cells at different time points. Uh, that's harder to do without, without knowing these pieces of information. So um, the neoantigen that we made, uh, it's also, you know, you induce it by flipping it over and it has, I don't know if, if I can describe this without a picture, uh, but it, it has this uh, three axon format where this you could third probably, axon. I mean, if you wanted to share a picture, you could, we, yeah. I think you guys do that on other yeah, podcasts. You right? can, if you have something ready, you're, you're welcome. I have to draw it, which okay. I think would be, a, I'll do it with my hand. So uh, you have, these, <laughs> nice. you have these antigens that are, that are normal. Uh, like imagine this is the DNA sequence. And then what you would have is this is GP 33 between my fingers. And then you have the same thing over here for GP66. Uh, and so what we've done is we've taken this central exon here, which has half of GP33 and half of GP66, and then we've inverted it. Uh, and then we use splice sites, which splice over this. So in the off state, you have, you're skipping this central exon here. Uh, and then when you flip it around now, now you can, it splices correctly, and now you get the production of that antigen. Uh, and then what we did is we put it inside of GFP. Uh, you know, there's this technique um, that uh, a lot of people might be familiar with where you have uh, you have two halves of GFP and, and you want to see if two proteins interact. So you fuse them to the interacting partners and then they, they bring it together and then GFP forms. So that was the inspiration for this idea that if we put the antigen in the DNA level that way, we could just make the first half of the antigen. And then when we flipped it around, now you'd make the whole thing. Uh, and that was that was how we made a fluorescent antigen. Yeah, and, the, and it turned green, so you could tell which cells it happened yeah. in, right? Yeah. How efficient the, was it? It's, it? it's efficient in the sense that the cells are green. It's inefficient in the sense that the, the quantum yield from the GFP is very low. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you can see it by fax. You can see it by uh, microscopy, but it's still very dim compared to the amount of GFP that's there. What uh, fraction of it, cells become yeah. green? Uh, any cell that turns it on will become green. So it depends on what the inducing signal is. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So I think yeah. it's one, one of the problems with Crelox and some of these things is like some of the cells do it and some don't. And then that can create a problem depending on what system you're trying to do and what question you're trying to ask. And I guess you, you have a little bit of an advantage because you're turning it on. Yeah. And so even if it's not in all the cells, it doesn't necessarily matter or it does, or, you know, what is the efficiency, I guess? It's pretty efficient. Um, the efficiency has much more to do with the other half of the allele mm-hmm. uh, and, and the efficiency of the other portions. But once you get the recombination, 100% of the cells will turn it off. Now, uh, to get this to get this flipping, you have an enzyme that needs mm. to be expressed, right, called FlipO. Is yes. that what you call it? It's called, yeah, it's FlipBase, but uh, FlipO flip is uh, the optimized version of it. Okay. Uh, and that is also on the allele broken in half in the same way. Uh, and then when you give Cree recombinase, it flips that thing around. Uh, and then now if you, it can't produce the protein because it still needs doxycycline and tamoxifen. Uh, but once you give those drugs, now it will act on that neoantigen part and flip that thing around. Right. Uh, so we're we thinking of okay. multiple levels of regulation. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So and, the first level is, is the, the flipase, the flipase that you're using to flip yeah. that to then produce the neoantigen. And then the other levels are coming from the other regulatory element that you've kind of touched on, but um, 
the, the and make the flip base. Yeah. The flip base is in the uh in that regulatory module. Uh that's right, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh and and we thought, you know, it was better to make something where none of these systems are perfect. So each one of them has a little bit of leakiness. So we put them, the three of them together, hoping that that would keep it off. Uh, and it works very well um, until, you know, in, in the standard conditions. It, 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 uh, if, if the mouse has never seen Cree, it, it's actually perfect. Uh, in, in some of the Cree expressing mice, uh, you can see just a tiny bit of leakiness. Uh, but right. we figured out that if you give Cree ER, that sort of solves that problem too. Right. Um, so the Cree recombinase flips the yeah. the flipase, which then turns on the neo antigen. Yeah, sorry, that's that's the but then you that's... still also have to have the drug treatment. Yes, yeah, so right. you have to yeah. make the flipase DNA, then <laughs> turn on the transcription of that, then activate uh, it. Yeah, activate it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry I didn't describe that very well, but there's there's actually those three levels of regulation. So you flip it around and then doxycycline will cause transcription. Uh, and then tamoxifen will cause, it, it's an ER form, so it'll go into the nucleus and then cause that recombination. Uh, and it's overly complicated, uh, I think, just, just- That's why it has to be a ninja. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and you guys don't get to see it, but in his talk, he had little mice with little ninjas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> that's really cute. cute. <laughs> now, for our, for our listeners, it might be helpful just- so, so what the, the relevance of tamoxifen and doxycycline, you know, what are they binding that you included then in this element? Yeah. So there's a, uh, there's a tet inducible promoter, tetracycline inducible promoter, uh, that is bound by, a, an RTTA, which is, uh, the, the last part is transactivator. It's a reverse tetracycline, reverse engineered tetracycline transactivator. Basically what it is, it's a, a tet binding site that has, a, um, uh, a transactivator on it. And when it, when there's doxycycline in the, in the system, then it goes and binds. Uh, and then that causes transcription. And then you make this protein, but it goes into the cytoplasm. Uh, it's held there by the, the estrogen receptor, uh, the half of the estrogen receptor that's on it. And so then you give tamoxifen and that releases it and allows it to go to the nucleus. Uh, those are things I, that a lot of people use. We didn't make any mm -hmm. of that. Right, right. But it's it's interesting, you know, in, the, in this field, uh, you know, people have probably heard of doxycycline, they may have heard of tamoxifen. And so it's, for our listeners to know, like, it's years and years of building upon these tools from knowledge from other systems and other fields that then you can combine together. Right. And, and we, we definitely took advantage of work that so many other groups were doing uh, to make all of those little elements, uh, you know, well, we, we, the only thing that we, we figured out how to do is to put them together like Legos mm -hmm. uh, wow. and maybe I figured out splicing, but <laughs> that was <laughs> well, that's, it's still quite, quite a lot of work and ingenuity. And I'm curious, you know, in your paper, you had talked about over the course of seven iterative versions. And I'm curious, yeah. I didn't read that supplement, but what, 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 what is the story of those versions and what were some of the interesting determining factors that led you to a high fidelity, a product, you know, that had high efficiency in that work? Yeah. So we, uh, I, I call that, I actually, when I wrote the paper, uh, I wrote that whole part and then, uh, my postdoc said that was my diary and, and made me put it in the, in the supplement and I put it there so that nobody would ever read it, but it would be there, you know, as a memory for, of, of my, my torture. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, we, I, I had this idea, we'll put this thing into, uh, we'll make this thing, we'll see if it works. And uh, I stuck it on the end of GFP and it works. And then I was ready to go. Uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, after I gave lab meeting once, that I'm going to make this mouse and it's going to be every, it's going to be green in every, every tissue. And wouldn't it be better if it, if it, if it became green when you turned it on? Uh, and so I went back to the drawing board and tried to figure out how to make it connect the, the activation of the neoantigen module to the antigen or to the expression of GFP. Uh, and it turned out that that just did not work uh, at all. Uh, it was, it would, I would get the perfect recombinations. It would be immunogenic. Uh, it would run a nice Western, but it was just the cells were not green. Uh, and eventually, and this is, I think, one of the advantages of working on something like LCMV uh, is eventually one night I was sitting there thinking about it. Why is the cells not turning green? And I thought about the fact that this is a membrane. GP is a membrane protein. 
Uh, and so I Googled, where's the transmembrane domain? And it turns out that the trans, the signal, I think it's the signaling peptide uh, is actually in, in between GP33 and GP66. That, that is a non-canonical uh, signal peptide that uh, LCMV has. And there was a whole literature on this, which was nice because I didn't have to figure it all out. So I replaced that out and then the cells turned green and then I could move on. Nice. That took me on six or seven months to figure out. <laughs> oh, wow. See, this, these stories are good because it's helpful for, you know, scientists in training and even scientists not in training to know this is a long process. <laughs> yeah. With a it lot was, of failures. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of failures. And they didn't make, you know, when you're trying to do something for the first time, you often, uh, you don't, you don't have a reference book sometimes. Right. And you don't know why something's not working. And sometimes it just takes sitting on your couch, thinking about it and Googling to figure it out. So. So, Steph, so I think, your goal uh, with this whole thing, oh, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say your goal with this whole thing was to make antigens appear that were not in the thymus. So then you could test whether you generated T cell responses or not. Yeah. Right. So you must have at some point tested whether there were T cell responses or not. And then like had this moment that you were jumping up and down that the system yeah. worked, right? Well, actually, there were two moments when I jumped up and down. The first was, uh, I don't know, maybe I should tell the process of how you make a knock-in mouse, which is you, you, uh, you, we use an ES cell facility. They, they target the ES cells. You do a bunch of Southerns, you identify a clone. I was very excited to get a clone. They made a mouse uh, and they, they take it and they make chimeric mice and they gave me back six mice. Uh, and there are various different coat colors. You know, they're mixtures of the ES cell and the, the, in this case, it was a black sex mouse. So they're kind of a mix of brown and black. Um, and there's one of those mice that's 80% chimeric and the other ones are lower percentage. And I bred them to every mouse I could looking for a brown mouse. Uh, and none of them would breed uh, except for this one 80% mouse who gave pups one time, gave out two pups and they were, they were transgenic. Uh, and they were knock-ins, and, and then I moved on. You know? oh that was, wow. <laughs> after months of trying to breed this mouse, uh, you know, knowing that it was the, it was the mouse, uh, it, it wouldn't it would not breed. It only bred to one time, and then finally I had some pups, and the whole thing went from there. Wow. Uh, wow. And uh, the bet I. I, it, they came out right before a lab meeting and I took a picture. I have it in one of my lab meetings. Of, the mouse looks like he's jumping up and there's some little pups there. And, uh, and so it was a very exciting moment for all of us. So, <laughs> so all of these, had, all of these elements we, you just described are all on one plasmid. Is that correct? They're all in one locus. Uh, they're all in the Rosa locus. Mm -hmm. so, how big is the, uh, how big is the plasmid with all of these elements on it? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, probably, uh, I, I've forgotten now, it's been a while, probably 16 kb. Okay. Uh, it's pretty big. It, in the middle of it, it has an insulator, mm -hmm. uh, which was another thing I did. And, and I did it. Now I'm wondering if it does anything, but I did it. The, the, the worry, the, when you make these mice, and this is, this is a really uh, useful thing, I think, is that you make, you make mice... Uh, especially a complex system, and you're only going to make it once. Uh, and certain things you can't know until you actually do it uh, and see what happens. And in this case, we were worried about one element in the mouse affecting the other element. Uh, and so I had to take a guess that it would be better if I did this, I added this piece in there. So I did. Uh, and I've always wondered to myself, was it worth those extra? You took it out, would it matter? <laughs> work. Get that thing in there as well. So when you feed these mice docs and tamoxifen, what does this get produced in all cells essentially? Yeah. So the, the way it works now is when we, when we cross them, we turn it on in a few different contexts, right? So uh, anytime you give Cre, uh, then you can, and the cells have RTTA, uh, that's not on the allium. Uh, anytime you give Cre and, and the cell has RTTA, you can feed the mice docs and tamoxifen and they will then, the cells expressing the Cre will turn it on. Uh, so we've used it in a few different ways. One is our cancer models are all driven initially by getting Cree. You know, this was the system that Tyler had made. Actually, that this is the one that I was so inspired by when I was in, at the NIH. Um, and, uh, you know, you give Cree, you activate a, an oncogene, KRAS, by removing something called a lock-stop-locks out of the promoter. 
Uh, and you and so we use that same inductive event to then activate the, the genes per ninja. Uh, and so that way we get tumors that ex express that neoantigen and then grow and we can study responses. Uh, in peripheral tissues, we've also started to cross this mouse to different Cre-ER uh, strains where the Cre-ER is expressed under uh, the promoter for the, the hepatocytes or the skin or other, other situations. And then those mice, we just feed them doxycycline tamoxifen. Uh, and they'll turn on antigen in the tissue that we have, have set And up. you've also infected them with adenovirus that encodes the right. flippase, and then you can induce yeah. it locally. Yeah, so in the paper, sorry, some of this is, is, is subsequent to the paper, I apologize. Uh, but, you know, uh, in, the, in the, um, uh, the, the initial way we, we studied this was we would infect them with an ad flip or ad cre. Uh, and then test to see if it would work. And I like that because it's sort of a, it's like the equivalent of an acute infection mm -hmm. uh, where you you can infect them and and we were giving it IV, so it would infect the, the liver and maybe also I think part of the spleen. Uh, and we would get these really strong responses on magnitude wise, they were actually quite similar to LCMV infection. So we could elicit very powerful responses from the endogenous T cells against this uh, in those contexts. Uh, and it, it's really context dependent, you know, how, how the T cells will respond. It's very context dependent. I, mean, you, I, I like that it was very rigorous because you, you um, put in transgenic T cells. You could show you it could activate those. Mm -hmm. You could do it in the transgenic mouse and show you can activate the transgenic T cells. But then you also showed the endogenous T cells. Right. So it worked every which way that you tried it, which was really yeah. cool. And we wanted, we wanted, you know, part of the reason I, I we, we kind of had this, this demonstration that way was because of the way I thought that other people might want to use this allele, mm -hmm. you know, right. I, I, that they would have something that they could look at and say, oh, this, it does this, it doesn't do that, <laughs> you know? Uh, and we, we are very hopeful. One of the nice things about coming on here is we are very hopeful that people will use it. So uh, we, we send it out to, to all, kinds of, all kinds of groups. So happy to yeah. send it out. I, I could actually imagine that you could take this and use a Cree that is, um, Express in the thymus and then make it a central tolerance model yeah. as well. <laughs> you know, uh, and actually uh, we had the air Cree R mice, uh, Mark Anderson was very nice and sent them to us uh, and nobody in the lab had the bandwidth to do the experiment. And I'm kind of hoping that somebody somewhere will, will get them and, and ask these kinds of questions. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I think that there's a lot of questions that, that can be asked with something like this and, Right. way more than one group could ever ask. And so it's it's very exciting to me that other people would, would use this uh, for their research. So tell me how you have a mouse which now has this cassette incorporated, no Cree, no nothing. How do you show there's no tolerance in that mouse? Yeah, so the way we did it was we infected it with LCMV. Uh, and... Uh, in that case, we could study the magnitude of the response and show that there was really no difference uh, between mice that were ninja and mice that were um, uh, wild type B6 mice. And, and there's quite a big difference when you turn on the antigen a little bit, uh, then, then you have a pretty powerful suppression of the, the response. And, and you we were... actually have a, a, a model now where we turned on the liver uh, and in that case, you you get express you get a response if you infect the mouse before you turn it on, uh, but if you wait if you turn it on in the liver and then you wait seven days, you'll get no response. So you can actually tolerate the mouse pretty quickly. That, those are the studies that I thought would be really interesting is yeah. to, to look at what how tolerance is generated, peripheral tolerance is generated, and what regulates that, and start manipulating yeah. that. We've done a little of this uh, where, you know, this, the liver and the skin and a few other organs, and it's really just fascinating, you know, different tissues. I think tolerance, the outcome of tolerance is very different uh, depending on the, the tissue itself. And so uh, and the determining factors for, because you, you mentioned context dependency in these different sites, the, the, the is it specific to that tissue's ability to induce tolerance or is it something more technical with the Cree in yeah. that tissue and like how, how well developed that is for that tissue? Is it both? 
I think it's, I think it, I think the, the boring answer would be that the second one is important, uh, which yeah. almost is the case. Uh, but I think that a lot of it is also the biology, you know, with the right. liver example, uh, we think that the T cells are getting activated in the liver because if you block them from going in the, into the liver, if you just trap them in the spleen with FTY720, now infect the mouse, they will, that'll prevent them from getting tolerized. So they have to go through the portal circulation into the liver before they'll get tolerized. Um, if we do it in the skin, uh, it's a very different outcome. There you'll get uh, T cells that are effector cells uh, and they'll attack the skin, uh, in the, especially in the context of checkpoint therapy. Like if you give, I mean, we study tumors, so it's sort of an obvious thing for us to do to give PD-1 blockade and now they'll attack the skin. We even have one mouse, and I think this is a little bit of a technical issue, but we have one mouse where you put it in just the K14 positive cells, and those mice get just unbelievably sick when you turn on antigen uh, because the T cells go crazy. So I think it's, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot to be learned in terms of how these, what we thought of as maybe one process works in different tissues. Uh, and that's that's something that we, and I hope others would be interested in. So are you going to identify like new populations of memory T cells <laughs> depending on the tissue? Yeah, I'm worried. That's the what I'm worried. The tissue resident memory cells, right? <laughs> when I was a grad student, we, I, you know, we named uh, the populations of T cells. I was so happy about this. I was so proud of, you know, and now I, now I'm like, if I, if I name more populations, people will really hate me. So uh, <laughs> Uh, well, how, are you going and looking at the, uh, you know, central memory and effector memory? And like, cause I, I, I don't, I get lost on all the different markers that are on the surface of all of these, uh, yeah. um, I, but you I can honestly, dissect all those populations with and without activation and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we, we study all of that. It's, it's not that, uh, we, that this is what we study. We study, you know, markers and everything. Uh, I'm just afraid of making new names for things, uh, <laughs> because so we're like, oh, Nick and his naming. I uh, know. He's an immunologist. We love names. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that I'm, they'll start throwing things at me eventually. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I think it's useful to to understand, you know, these comparative things. You know, uh, we compare T cell responses and LCMV to these T cell responses in tissues to T cell responses in cancer. Uh, and again, it's all very context dependent. Uh, and so the models are very versatile for being able to ask, you know, how those contexts are are driving differences. And I got a chance to see some of the data that you were kind of alluding to as you were talking about that. You're like, I got ahead of myself because this paper really kind of sets the stage for what you can do with these mice. And there's a yeah. little bit of turning on the antigen and tumors and showing that if you put, you know, like uh, specific T cells in, you can get them to kill, et cetera. But do you want to comment a little bit on the more recent work that you're doing or yeah, would you sure. rather not? No, 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 it's fine. We, we, we've been now studying how, you know, in mice where tumors are developing, uh, you know, where, where you have lung cancers, what we mostly study, uh, you know, you turn on KRAS and then and, and remove P53, you start to get development of a tumor. Uh, we've been studying how T cells will respond to that uh, and the process of exhaustion, which seems to be very much driven inside the tumor. Uh, and this concept uh, that I think is interesting for cancer immunologists, especially that there's a fraction of, of tumor specific cells that kind of hide out in the lymph node uh, and sort of maintain the, the T cell response over the course of months of, of, of T cell of tumor development. Uh, and so the models let us to, let us ask those kinds of questions. Uh, you know, in this long term, how do you maintain a T cell response over five months? Uh, this is this is where it's really useful for asking those questions. So what are the kinetics when you when you feed the mice? Docs, Tamox, have you looked at T cell induction over time and what, what are the kinetics of that? Yeah, so we've done a little bit of this. Uh, you know, we will, the trick we use, um, uh, probably because I'm a junior PI is, and we don't have a lot of mice, uh, is that we, we, we put luciferase inside of those P14 T cells. Uh, and then we study uh, the, just using IVIS, we study the, the mice over time and we can see where the T cells are. Um, and it, it, you know, it's a good system. It of course has all of the problems that TCR transgenics have. So for example, in that liver model, those T cells disappear very, very quickly, uh, because it's a, a tolerance model. Uh, 
uh, in other tissues that doesn't happen. So you, it is subject to the, the biology of the response. Uh, but it is a very convenient way for us to first narrow down sort of the kinetics of a response. Uh, and in most cases, we use that as our first screening screening part to see if the tissue is expressing the antigen, if the T cells will go there, and we feel pretty confident that we've we've activated it. Uh, many, and that just turns how many days does that take? Depends on the system. Uh, you know, what's really great about that system is you usually see the T cells in the draining lymph node. Uh, like day, day two or three, uh, day five or six, sometimes you'll see them getting into the tissue and then you can kind of watch them really accumulate in the tissue. Uh, and then the question that we haven't really fully characterized is, is how long they stick around. Uh, in the skin, we saw that they stuck around. In the colon, my grad student just told me today they're sticking around. Uh, so, but it's, it's sort of ongoing in terms of- So what, if you then withdraw docs and TAM- do they go away? So the docs and TAM cause a permanent recombination. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so so we, we did not set it up. I, I thought a lot about this. We did not set it up so that you could turn the antigen back off. Yeah. Um, and the the promoter that we use is an extremely strong, you know, universal promoter. So we really blasted. Uh, whether or not the cells stick around is the hardest part for us to assess, uh, you know, uh, usually, if we can do facts on a tissue, we can see the GFP positive cells uh, from the tissue. But uh, doing facts on skin cells or every every tissue is 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 different, and we're slowly muddling th through learning how to get out different epithelial populations and run facts on them. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking you could do if you could turn it off, then you could look at memory, right? Yeah. So you need to go back and redesign one that'll reverse it <laughs> <laughs> in your spare time. Well, that, that was some of the cool studies where they turned off an antigen and saw how long memory persisted. Like, would memory persist if you lost antigen, you know? Um, yeah. Those those studies were done quite a number of years ago now. Yeah. But I it mean, seems we, like your system may even be better poised to do that if you could, you know, tweak it. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the nice thing about these models is they are modular in the sense that you could add in another you know, there are other recombinases, there are other inducers. We've played around a little bit with, you know, another generation ninja model. Uh, you know, just, I, I think that I, I like this approach of designing models as a primary thing that the lab does, um, you know, and so that long-term, that's something I definitely want to be doing, you know, specifically to ask questions I think are, are useful like this and make tools that other people can use. Uh, so my question might come from the fact that I just finished teaching a semester of immunology. And so there are a few sort of things that are on my mind. Um, so you said at one point that it seemed to take about seven days for the cells to become tolerized. Um, well, that's when we looked. Okay. That's, uh, I think we tried as early as day three or so. So the experiment is a little bit, uh, what's actually happening there, which I think is amazing, is that you're turning on antigen and then you're relying on all of the migration of cells throughout the body to take all of the T cells that are specific for that antigen and have them go through the liver, right? I think that's what the hold is. And so within seven days, that has happened to the point where there's no cells that will respond. Um, okay. Now, whether or not it happened earlier, I'm not sure. Uh, because we, the other thing we've done is we've gone in and pulled out those cells mm -hmm. uh, using tetramer enrichment, and they're there. There's just a few hundred of them, but it's a really just painful experiment to get them out. So I, I, it's hard to say whether there would be cells elsewhere. We only use this, do they respond to the LCMB infection at our readout? Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm imagining them as being energized, so you'd have to do that experiment. <laughs> we we, oh. we that's that's what we we think as well. And the, you know they have sort of transcriptionally they have every inhibitory receptor on their surface. Uh, the, there's very small numbers of them. It's the only thing that makes me a little nervous, but they do look very tolerized. And we tried to give all the checkpoint blockades that we could and 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 LCMB infection, and it still didn't get them going again. So. Yeah. So that was my next question: was was there a way to break the tolerance? Not, not, we didn't figure it out. 
But one of the things that I've been interested in with those kinds of systems is, of course, we're just doing it in feed the mouse doxycycline tamoxifen. But I, I'm sure that other people would be interested in if you, uh, you know, give a different microbiome or you, you know, put them out high fat diet or, you know, there's like a million ways that this kind of a system could be played around with. Uh, to, to ask how that changes these, these responses. Can you, can you ask if you can break tolerance more easily if things escape the thymus and saw an antigen versus if they didn't see it in the thymus and got out into periphery? Because sort presumably of. the autoantigens that are that we have, you know, autoimmunity to did derive from partially centrally tolerant, not, not, not negatively selected, but they made it through the gauntlet, but they're still somewhat autoreactive. Those might be somewhat different than the ones that come out and have never seen antigen, but then you show the antigen in the periphery without an infection. Yeah. So I think this is a really good question. And I think Ninja could be used for this, but there are actually uh, a number of other studies that have that have paved the way for this idea, you know, like this uh, studies from Mark Jenkins and others who, where they mm -hmm. pulled out T cell specific for GFP and different yep. transgenders and saw, you know, some now they're getting more TH17s or other, other, other things. I think, I think the exposure of T cells in the thymus generating tolerance is, is probably more nuanced than, than I appreciate it and maybe others do. Mm -hmm. uh, but this idea, I think when, when T cells see antigens in the thymus, the, the, the outcome isn't always tolerance. Uh, and that may be concentration of antigen dependent or dependent on the other signals they see. Oh, see, I was wondering about it in terms of whether peripheral tolerance mechanisms were the same in different compartments. And so could you actually determine some things about immune privilege or oral tolerance or things like that um, by trying to see how you could induce it in different compartments? Yeah, that's sort of what we've started doing with this turning it on in different tissues. But I think we could uh, that would only start to start to scratch the surface. I think because uh, oral tolerance is is even more cool than what we're what we're doing. Uh, but I think um, you know, I think these you know maybe the other way of asking it is is maybe the timing aspect. That's another thing which I and I'm sure other people are very interested in is a lot of the classic experiments where you remove the thymus of the mouse, you know, before day three of life and then they get, you know, disease. Uh, you know, this idea that early thymus export is a time, the early body is a time when you get tolerized. Uh, does that same properties, how does it compare if you did early mouse and late mouse? You know, does, does tolerance work the same way over, over different time points? Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of those kinds of questions I think that are are still open. So are you aging some of these mice and see if you flip it when they're older? <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're, we're probably going to send them to people who will. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. You know, even if they, I'm not entirely sure. So if somebody wants them and wants to age them, we're we're more than happy to send them. Because <laughs> I mean, can cancer is not exclusively, but much much more common in the aged population. So it'd be interesting to know whether the T cell responses yeah. would be affected. I think it's a it's a fascinating question. It's the kind of question you need like a whole grant on. To <laughs> yeah. We have people here who study aging, and 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 I am just so impressed by by those experiments because you really have to you have to have the fortitude to make mice get really old, yeah. which be in it for the long haul, right? <laughs> that's brave. It's expensive. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, I, you know, I think that's why we all do science, right? Because you never run out of questions. Uh, is you know, I think we'll we'll all be in business for a long time. So you had mentioned earlier that there were two moments when you were jumping up and down, and I think you got to tell us about the brown mice uh, that yeah. you found the two pops from the one dam. Did you get to tell us about the second jumping up and down moment? Second one, second one was when we uh, when I turned it when we did turn it on. Right. Uh, and, you know, we finally got out responses. I mean, uh, you know, that was a several year process to to get to the point where we actually studied that. And one of the the kind of parallel moment was I had actually made this mouse pretty early on in my graduate or my postdoc. Uh, you know, I was a postdoc for six, seven years and we had the mouse for probably three of those years at least. Uh, but in Tyler's lab, we had no way of studying really the CD4 T cell response. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when I started my own lab and someone downstairs had the 
smart mice and gave us the Tetramers, then we were really excited to uh, again see that we were see, we were actually seeing CD4 T cell responses. Uh, that was a that was pretty exciting as well. <laughs> After years of of just assuming that there was a response, see actually seeing it was very exciting. You still work in the lab, Nick? Do I do work in the lab? Uh, not as much as I I think I would like. Uh, I've, I've mostly been in the, in the office writing grants for uh, you know the last couple of years. But I'm, I'm hopeful now that you know things are kind of stabilizing. Where we're you know the the lab is. Uh, gotten to the point where uh, the first group of people are really uh, coming towards their their publishing papers. They're they're starting to look to graduate, and so maybe I will go take a small project in the lab to try and ease the transition uh, between when when all my great people leave and when the next group of great so, people. That's always a tough one. Yeah. The transitions. So, what part of uh, lab work do you like best? Because you do some constructions, you do mouse work. Uh, what, what's the best part for you? I like molecular biology the best, I think. Uh, and you know, this is a. Uh, I had I had one of those experiences as an undergrad, uh, which I think every undergrad should have, which is that uh, I worked. Um, it was this at Michigan with uh, Joel Swanson, who you guys oh, yeah, met. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, Joel was, uh, he's a macrophage biologist. Uh, we were putting listeria on macrophages and watching phagocytosis. And he, he says, well, why don't you clone this, this, this pH reporter? It was a, looking at uh, phospholipid signaling. And nobody in the lab knew molecular biology, and, and I didn't know molecular biology. So I, I went around to every lab and asked questions of the different people asking them to teach me how to do molecular biology and, and sort of taught myself how to clone one piece of DNA into another piece of DNA. That was a whole, like, I, 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 now it would be the kind of thing you do in a week, but it took me <laughs> six months, but I, I learned so much about, about the process that I've always been really just enamored with, with molecular biology since. So, uh, you know, I think, I think every graduate, every undergrad should have that experiment. Maybe every graduate student too, of learning on their own something uh, that they can then really feel like they they really learn it. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure we we always give that experience these days. That was very sure. powerful. The other question I I had was when so you had these mice and you know people will request them, you will send them to them. But what is the logistical uh, setup if you want to do you set can you sell these to to a company i i don't know the stages of events to, to bring yeah. it to like jackson labs and then they sell it do they pay you do they you know how does that work we put it in we deposited it through something called the mmrcc mmrrcc I, I get it mixed up it's actually it's a really great thing that the nci has done I think it's the nci uh where they will pay this consortium to to take mice models and put them into Jackson or, or to freeze them down or whatever. Uh, so we put it in and they put it in Jackson. It was right about the time the pandemic hit. Wow. And they, they took it and they froze it. And so the mouse is at Jackson, uh, but unfortunately not... people can't order it from Jackson. So we are now the de novo supplier for, for groups, which is fine. Um, right. It just, it, it makes more work for yeah. you guys, because you're having to do, you know, the MTAs and the packaging, the shipping. And then, well, hopefully, do you know, is there a timeline for Jackson to start, you know, to redrive them and to breed them? And I don't think they're planning on it. You know, around the time that the, the you know, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the number of mice that Jackson has that are alive has really narrowed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be a strategic decision on their part. But what I think it means is that a lot of the mice that used to be available are now Mm. narrowed uh and so I, I assume if somebody asked for it they would thaw it and send it to them but for us to send it as a live mouse is much easier so sure we have done that well we deposited you have uh, a tech that their full-time job is to do that yeah but uh, <laughs> if we deposited a that, transgenic that line years ago at jack's and um then we stopped using it and then last year we wanted to work with it again and they revived it but it was five grand, five thousand yeah. dollars, and we didn't get any of that back. So to answer your question, Steph, you don't get royalties. <laughs> right. Um, I think if they sell the mouse to a company, like uh, the the company will send money to your university. Maybe, maybe to the uh, university, right? But right. just wake, just waking it up is five thousand because that 
Yeah. That's what it costs them, I suppose, to do it, you know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, so, good, oh, no. I was going to say, they, are, they, they, they do good work there. I don't want to sound like yeah. I'm bashing Jackson. I mean, no, I no, no. I, it's fine. I just, the curious of, of the, you know, procedure of how, how it all works. Yeah, no, that's, I, it's a, it's one of those things that I didn't know of how it worked and then we did it. Uh, and you actually have to know quite a bit about a strain when you deposit it. They ask you all kinds of details, some of which we really couldn't answer uh, because, you know, they want to know how many times you've back crossed a mouse. Uh, and while we had records going back to the original mouse, it wasn't exactly like we were always crossing it to black six mice. They wanted to know how many times you've crossed it to a black six mouse from Jackson. Uh, and they want very specific definitions, and I, don't, I didn't want to mess it up, so we we basically said, I don't know if it's it, it's on a black six background. It was made on black six, but is it technically black six? You know, according to your definitions, that's a, that's a challenge. So. Well, um, as we wrap up, name give us a couple things you've talked a little bit about, but give us a couple things you're looking forward to in your lab and, and in the future. Some projects that excite you. So, uh, you know, we're really interested now in the understanding more about how T cells function in tissues. I think that's been uh, something that the the early papers that we've been able to put out have sort of laid the groundwork for us to at least follow in the footsteps of a lot of great work that's being done on those same questions in, in other systems. Um, and we recently got, you know, we've been collaborating with uh, Joe Kraft, who's here on T follicular health. Uh, so the lab has gotten a little bit more interested in the interactions between CD8s and TFHs. Uh, so those are two of the main areas. And the other one, which uh, is something I did as a postdoc and is something I'm really trying to get back into is, is tertiary lymphoid structures. Oh, nice. uh, we, had, we had noticed these associated with tumors in our animal models, and there's a lot of great work on them in humans uh, and some really nice work from others in, in other models. Uh, but I think we still don't really know what the what the cells are doing in them. So studying that process is, is something we like to do. All right. Thanks everybody. That's uh, immune number 51. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash immune. You can send your questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe TV is now a 501 C3, which means your contributions are federal U S tax deductible. So you go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a variety of ways by which you can do that. Nick Yoshi is at Yale University on Twitter, Yoshi Lab Yale, where he has a great quote by uh, Elton John. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. Great having you. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. It's been great talking with you. All this science I don't understand. It's just my job. Five days a week. You should you should really amend it to make it seven days a week, right? It is <laughs> the science amendment. I'm glad I'm glad you noticed that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a great. I've always loved that song. Fabulous song. It took me years to understand what it was about. You know. Yeah. Um, there's also when I was in Boston, there was a um, Laurie Anderson. Remember her? Big Science. She she had an album called Big Science. I always liked that one too. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle, Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Nick, for coming on. This was fun. Brian Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. And thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. In fact, next year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.